The kind of urban growth that India will see, you know, you will have a water crisis. You will be living in an area with high air pollution levels. And this is a time when the law should have been stronger to deal with the crisis that is happening both in urban areas and rural areas. Ritwik Datta is talking about the latest draft Environment Impact Assessment notification by India's Environment Ministry. The notification, if finalized, will change how industries are regulated and weaken protection given to the environment. But what does EIA cover? In 1994, the Environment Ministry came out with the EIA notification, a process to regulate environment clearances for new projects or expansions. Environment clearance is needed by projects related to mining coal or other minerals, thermal and hydropower plants, real estate and other industrial projects. The projects are assessed based on their potential impact on the environment by a panel of experts which then recommends clearance or rejects it. The final decision is then taken by the Environment Ministry. In March, while the country was under lockdown, the draft was made open to public suggestions or objections. Many research and environmental organizations, student groups and citizens have sent in their comments to the Ministry. The deadline for inputs, June 30th, approaches even as the pandemic continues. It was meant to be a law which would help the government uh, go ahead with uh, uh, you know, accepting economic growth, accepting investments in the country, as well as ensure that their environmental footprint is kept under serious check. Uh, uh, mitigation measures are put in place and they are complied with. Industries have often seen this process of obtaining clearance as a hindrance and many voices, including ministers, have termed it as an obstacle to development. It has changed several times and it has been stopped from being changed several times. And the last big overall of the EI notification was 2006. In this 14 years itself, if you would see, uh, there has been a gradual reading down of the EI notifications, reducing the scope of projects that are going to be covered, uh, the kind of scrutiny that you can do. Attempts to compromise these processes might have benefited a few people, but contributed to damaging the environment, people and the economy. The gas leak at LG Polymers in Andhra Pradesh on May 7th claimed the lives of at least 12 people and hospitalized many. The plant was operating over the last two decades without environment clearance. Poor regulation of environmental norms led to another disaster in the Parkjan oil field in Assam. The gas blowout and an unextinguished fire in the oil wells caused severe damage to livelihoods and the life forms in a region rich with biodiversity. The State Pollution Board had flagged that the oil well has been operating for over 15 years without obtaining prior consent to do so. By diluting public, official and scientific scrutiny, the 2020 EIA draft seems to be leaning in favour of the industry and does not strike a balance between development and the environment. This is significant amidst the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic fueled by the destruction of habitats and wildlife.
One of the main changes the draft proposes is to reduce public participation central to the EIA process. And what it basically means is that in the document that is prepared to examine whether the project is going to harm or uh, have any adverse uh, impact on the environment, that document is called an environmental impact assessment report. Now that report should not, as per the process, does not directly go to the decision maker. That report is to be shared with the public. A person who may be affected by the project or anyone interested in knowing about its impacts can participate in public hearings or send written suggestions based on the EIA report. In the new draft, a list of project types are proposed to be exempted from public participation. Modernization of irrigation projects, all building construction and area development projects, expansion or widening of national highways, all projects concerning national defense and security are part of the list. Additionally, the time allotted for public hearings has been reduced to speed up the clearance process. This makes it especially difficult for people living in rural or tribal areas who are most often directly impacted by industrial projects. Today, if you look at a hydropower project, you know, it takes how long? Six years, seven years, ten years for it to be constructed. But when it comes to public hearing, the today we have 30 days notice period, which is itself insufficient. And now they are saying for public hearing, the, you know, the, uh, the notice period is 30 days. We are reducing it to 20 days. What will you achieve by 10 days? Only thing that will be achieved is people will not be able to participate. The big change is in this notification is how it views uh, uh, post facto assessments and violations. Originally, the EI notification was based on the idea of evaluating the environmental impact before a project starts. But if the new draft is finalized, it leaves the field clear for industries to violate EIA norms first and seek clearance later. Uh, what was known to be a one-time amnesty scheme, uh, all the projects that have violated the EI notification to disclose that they have violated and go through a remediation process, uh, a penalty process uh, by, by the Ministry of Environment has been normalized. Now Coming back to LG Polymers in Vishakhapatnam, a couple of years ago, it was among the several applicants for a post facto environmental clearance. Its hearing was this May. But 10 days before the hearing, the gas leak incident occurred. How much do they have to pay from the start of the violation till the day they come voluntarily to, uh, to disclose that I violated the law? A project like a coal-fired power plant or a hydropower project is now supposed to pay 5,000 rupees per day for violation. 1.5 lakh rupees per month, a 20,000 crore coal-fired power plant, all they required to do is not follow the law, set up the project and pay 5,000 rupees as uh, environmental damages. It is an arbitrary exercise of power. It is giving reward to people who violate the law. An EIA report is supposed to contain information about the project site's ecology. In any Indian landscape, substantial changes occur with every season hosting a variety of flora and fauna, which is then recorded on the EIA report. But the draft suggests that the baseline data shall be collected for only one season, aside from monsoon, for all projects other than river valley projects. Unfortunately, project proponents don't realize is that you need a good EIA. Projects have become unviable largely because they have fudged information. Look at even cases like POSCO. What happened ultimately? is that because during the EIA process, they undermined the existence of people and forest and their dependence on it. The single largest direct foreign investment in the history of India had to pull out, largely because of public opposition. Ultimately, a weak EIA report or one where the clearance was fast-tracked could lead to environmental damage and also become economically unviable. If one is truthful, then do what an EIA requires is, you do a cost-benefit analysis. If, if it shows up that the loss of livelihood 
is not as much as the jobs and the benefits that are created yes it can be termed as development the environmental impact is controlled let it be shared with the public it, unfortunately people say immediately because we'll coming out with a mine it is development then show us the calculation these are pictures like of tigers shot on my land right now we get at least three different tigers some people here who are doing camera trapping there they say in that area five different tigers actually there was huge raiding pressure by wild boar deer guy deer so they would not grow much there so we started buying that land and it was also cheap because there was no road access to it there was no electricity and you just couldn't grow anything and we bought it we fenced it and we forgot about it with all these trees and a lot of uh, rainwater being harvested there two big natural water holes them now in summers in that entire valley these are probably the two last water holes of the water from march onwards the density of wild animals that visit our land like goes up tremendously and we get a lot of nilgai sambar deer and wild boar and with them we get predators and for the last 6 7 years a lot of sub adult tigers so tigers stay with their mother as cubs till they are about 2 to 2 and a half years old and then they have to leave the area and go find their own territory so quite often the males are pushed out to such a level that they have to leave the reserve altogether unfortunately when they leave the reserve the area just outside the reserve is totally barren a lot of them end up in places like that on that side after this wall that's a tiger reserve so what we've essentially done is almost got one mile long stretch between one hill there and one hill there uh, that we bought out along the tiger reserve so so essentially we've kind of cut off the farmland with the from the tiger reserve Uh, with our patch of land, which, which, which on which we don't grow, so it just goes wild. Pretty much all the predators that come here are on that side, and even uh, that area also has a lot of wild boars. So we don't go one for safety reasons, but the other big reason is if we start going there regularly, these animals will they won't come. So you just leave one patch as. inviolate in your own land the villagers who stay very close to the land there are 8 to 10 families which say you let them go it's their resource too and you tell them we like don't let cattle from outside come Ultimately, I mean, if you ask me why, why, why am I doing it? Just don't. There's no logic to it. Maybe just satisfaction, fun, the fact that you've got your own forest.